Tunji um, Odumoboni, Executive Director of MTech, is going to join us online as soon as... Uh, Okay, where were you talking from yesterday? Fantastic. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, good to see you in person. That handshake feels like digital cash. Yeah? Check my balance. This is interesting. You're welcome. I, I think I'm very excited. Um, Nawazi, um, 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 Hope, or Hope, as the case, is going to be joining us. Alexandra Boyin should join us as well. As soon as they are hooked up, Ma, I will let you know. At this point in time, I hand over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'd like to say a big thank you also to our wonderful Master Compare. You've been extremely professional over the last two year, days, keeping all of us quite upbeat and tuned in. Thank you. All right. I would like to very warmly welcome everyone in this room and all of our teaming viewers who are online and all of our attendants and participants who are online to this very last but very influential and impactful session. Um, the theme for our session would be looking at the financial inclusion impacts of digital remittances and cross-border payments in emerging countries. But I'd just like to do very quick introductions so that we can set the stage. And my name is Chizo Malize, one more time. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of FITC. I'm a transformational leader and, an, and a success accelerator. I'd also like to ask each person, thank you. I'd like to ask each person to take time to introduce themselves in your own way. And we'll start with you, Tunji. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Madam. Um, Tunji Odumboni, I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon, at least in person. Um, you know, it's it's good time to talk about tech, rec tech, fintech, and all that that brings together. I work for MTech. Um, I'm an executive director at MTech. Um, MTech, we are a technology provider for central banks, and we believe that the age of financial services technology. Um, requires modern central banking, um, given that central banks play a very pivotal role um, in you know, making the market stable, san um, bringing sanity and all of that. So we bring great tech technologies um, that on one hand central banks can use to regulate the, 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 the boots, um, to regulate the market players basically, and also um, on the currency side, which is the second aspect of where we play, we also bring currency technology, CBDC infrastructure. That is also very pivotal, you know, um, in driving some of the conversations we'll be having today. Payment across borders, um, financial inclusion and the like. So really delighted to be part of this wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll come to your Sita. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I think after lunch is not the right time to start having uh, intellectual uh, discussions. But we'll do our best. So my name is Osita Enwe. And I'm happy that um, what we began yesterday, that we are still continuing. And everyone, I think, is benefiting. For me, it has been thought-provoking. And... In, in, in my only two way, I'm committed to ordering the discussion. And then it's my hope that everyone will have to contribute until we make Africa our home and our home. Thank you. Thank you. Ehis will come to you. Yeah, good afternoon, all. My name is um, Ehis Um I'm, I'm, I'm a compliance and risk management and ESG professional. Um, I'm very excited about this um, um, program because um, technology is becoming um, ev our everyday um, life, um, um, even from, for the fin from the financial perspective. And um, I'm glad that we'll be looking at um, privacy because um, in my little experience, I've seen that um, we, we run with 
certain things we are looking at um the negative aspect i don't want to be using risk so that i can sound like a layman so i'll be talking to you more about how we can ensure that we protect our consumer as well as our organization from regulatory perspective thank, thank you thank you thank you very much and thank you we're looking forward to bringing that to the discussion we we'll come to you tunji we know that there is a little presentation we have to see we were looking at 10 minutes for that, but looking at the time, if you can make that seven to eight, that would be great. Please. All right, thank you very much, Ma. Um, so I've been asked to set context for this session. Um, it's going to be very brief. I just wanted to, can you go to the next slide? I'm not sure. I'm not sure the screen is displaying properly, though. It came up better earlier. All right, so when you talk about, when we talk about um, payments, really, um, that knows no border. You can, you know, have the desire to send money to um, someone outside of Nigeria, even though you're in Nigeria, and vice versa. And we see that happen a lot. The Japa syndrome is maybe even accelerating that. I'm sure if I asked us how many of us have, have had one friend or family in the last 12 months that have jackpot, we probably have maybe half of the room raising up. And that is, you know, potential for remittances into Nigeria. Because for every immigrant that we have outside of, outside of the country, there's a potential that they have families and friends that will need financial support from them. And at times, this is really critical when it comes to um, driving the well-being the education, healthcare, and all of that for people back home. So when we talk about financial inclusion, we talk about that in the context of the remittances um, and cross-border. Usually, we tend to focus more around the remittance piece, which is typically typically a small piece of the pie. You know, cross-border payments would cut across every form of payment, trade, um, investment. You know, it could be B to B, it could be you know C to C. It could even be government making payments across borders. But what's key here is that when you talk about it in the context of financial inclusion, remittances is really one of the areas that we should spend a bit of time on. And financial inclusion, like, um, like you know, a number of us have come to realize it's not a luxury. Um, I have a quote from the president of IMF, uh, Christian Lugard, who says that financial inclusion is really not a luxury. When you think about it, People have to be able to get paid for the services they offer, right? And when you think about Africa um, as a market, which is not something that we leverage quite a lot, we have products, people in Nigeria have products that are Nigerian-centric products. And if these products are find their way across the border, maybe to Ghana, it creates a huge opportunity for the producers, right? But when you think about the audio it's too yeah thank you you got that good thank you right so many times the the, the, the issue here is not really the mobility of the product Right, because some of these products, the logistic aspect of getting the product across the border is, you know, probably getting much better with each passing alliances between countries. The um, Africa in, um, Continental Free Trade Agreement is another opportunity that you know we expect to see a lot more intra-Africa trade happen. But what does that portend when it comes to getting paid and making payments. Next slide, please. All right, these are just some numbers for you to just consider. If you look at um, $48 billion in itself, those numbers don't make sense on, unless you then compare them to something. $48 billion represent remittances into Africa in 2021. And that, when you think about that, that's about 4% of the African GDP. So it's a significant um, sector or space to talk about, right? It's not something we can, over if remittances is controlling 
as much in some instances in some markets, you know, um, markets like um, the Gambia, like Lesotho, as much as 20-25% of their GDP. So imagine a quarter of a country's GDP um, is really, really around remittances. So having to make that more seamless, and there are a number of issues that we'll talk about. One of those issues is what you see in red, the rate. So for every dollar I send, right, um, across country, countries, or for every, so imagine I have to pay 10% or thereabout, you know, so if you are sending a hundred dollar, you probably lose ten dollars. That's quite a challenge for someone whose source of livelihood depend on on that two hundred dollar that he gets in a month or something. So how can we make this a lot more cheaper, a lot faster? You know, people have need for monies, and the, the, the turnaround time at times can be a problem. You know, it can be the difference between someone staying alive or somebody passing on, especially if you have monies coming to the country. For things like healthcare. Next slide. So when you then look at the options we have in the market, there are quite a number of options, and those suite of options keep broadening. Um, you know, we have a number of fintech innovation, and we'll talk a bit, a bit about them. Some of you have used some of these solutions, cheaper cash, um, let me see, a number of solutions out there. But the, the payment landscape in itself, um, when you look at it from an infrastructure stack, you have people that are attacking the customer layer, which is where you interface with the, the solutions. So solutions like cheaper cash enables you to send money across Africa. But there are certain platforms as well that provide that infrastructure layer, that provide the settlement and the liquidity that is required. So you have solutions being built around that area, Flutterway, Paystar, Chills. There are a number of solutions there. But you also see a number of regional solutions um, perhaps is one of those that I think we should talk strongly about that hopefully will facilitate a lot more cross-border payment within Africa. Um, we are seeing banks as well deploy their solutions, and particularly banks with um, regional presence. Um, I know about the number of banks that are leveraging their branch network across Africa. So it's not really the liquidity pool, which is always an issue when it comes to cross-border payment. Because when you think about transacting between countries, Nigeria to Kenya, for example. So it's actually transaction between Naira and, um, um, I've forgotten the, the Kenya shillings. It's actually, so do you have that liquidity existing? So what you find most of the time is even the transaction between Nigeria and Ghana, just our next door brother, you have to always go through dollar because the liquidity is not always there. The, those peers. And when you begin to think about other other regions in, in the continent, it's even more daring, the kind of issues you have. So you're having banks leverage um, their branch network, UBA, Access Bank, and some of the big banks within West Africa, um, and also in the East Africa region, KCB, um, South Africa, you have Standard Bank, leveraging their branch network to facilitate um, inter-country inter payments. Mobile money is something that you know, we've spoken about very um, deeply in recent times. And PESA is one of those flagship products. And how this is enabling payments. You know, there's a lot of, I, I travel a lot to the East African zone, and I see a lot more collaboration happen than, you know, what we see in the West when it comes to intra-regional intra payment. And, you know, a lot of that is facilitated by, you know, the mobile network infrastructure that allows people to be able to pay seamlessly. So while you have the, um, the SIM card, you have the mobile money service provision. So that's another option. And the other option we're seeing around cryptocurrencies and blockchain enabled solution. And in this category as well, I'm going to put um, the central bank digital currency, which hopefully also enables some form of intra-country um, intra transfer. And we're seeing a number of projects in that regard where central banks are focused on addressing the issues around cross-border payment through CBDCs. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll just rush through the, you know, the next two, three slides. These are some of the challenges we see. Obviously, like I touched on, the, um, the World Bank target when it comes to the cross-border, um, the, the fees you pay on cross-border payments or cross-border transactions is about 3%. And I have a slide that shows that Africa is, you know, 
is up there when it comes to the high cost. So we're hovering around 9% and we still have quite a way to go when it comes to bringing that cost down to a 3% target. So that cost is high. And some of the solutions and discussions we're going to be offering in this panel discussion is looking at how can we forge partnership, lasting partnership that can enable you know, that cost to come down. Because you know, ultimately, when we talk about remittances, we are talking about people that really have this cost concerns. Um, and the more we can bring that cost down, the more the former means of transfer becomes appealing to them. Fragmented payment system is another issue. Um, I already touched on um, FX fluctuations and the liquidity pool. You know, by the time you look, when you look at the currency pairs, I give an example of Nigeria, Naira, um, Kenya, shilling. You have to be liquid in both ways to do those transactions bilaterally, except you put in between those currencies a proxy um, currency like dollar, which is always liquid, irrespective of the country that or direction you're going. So by the time you are bringing a third currency to do the exchange, you're already talking about an exposure against Naira, and you're also talking about an exposure against shillings. By the time you have to do that transfer from Naira to dollar, from dollar to shillings. So those are some of the challenges that, you know, solutions like PAPS is looking to solve, so that you don't really have to, um, you know, go from in, a, a, an African currency to a U.S. currency before you come back to Africa. Speed of transaction is always, it's always an issue. How, quick, how can we make this payment faster, quicker? And obviously, there are a lot of regulatory issues when it comes to payment. Payment is a regulated space. Now, when you're moving payment from a country like Nigeria to a country like Mozambique, Two separate regulatory landscapes. How do we harmonize that? So those are some of the concerns and challenges we have to sort of look at and deal with. Next slide, please. Low cost um, remittances. Obviously, those who promote um, a number of um, will foster competition um, because people want to bring down the cost. Is usually the driving force of cost, but that payment. Um, but you know, as part of this, we need regulatory reforms to make sure that competition is healthy and we can have solutions that are really fit for market. Um, you know, so those are, those are some of the points that I already touched on next slide because of time. Um, the other point to make here is, you know, the impact that I believe when we leverage digital properly, uh, we can see with regards to cross-border payment. One of that is increased access, um, both offline and online solutions exist. Right, and how that can increase accessibility. We, we all know what you know. An average Nigeria went through a couple of months back with regards to um, the cash issue. So, increased accessibility to these um, modes of payment can really be a big game changer when it comes to leveraging digital, lower cost, faster transfer, and even things like promoting entrepreneurship, innovation. Um, but there's regulatory challenges and opportunities to talk about as well. There are a couple of that. I think I will leave that for the panel discussion because of time. Um, some of the regulatory trends that we're seeing um, in the market, and you know, that is not something that we've seen in Nigeria alone or in South Africa or Kenya alone. We see a number of those regulatory changes when it comes to, um, you know, perhaps is the solution that central banks across Africa are all supportive of to drive cross-border payment. We are seeing central banks launch regulatory sandboxing to drive innovation within the payment space. And that also includes payments that cross crosses border. So I'll take my bow at this point and hope that we can get into more details of the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tunji, for helping to put context into the discussions of this uh, very plenary. And I'm definitely going to come back to you to start out on our deliberations. No. So seeing all of these opportunities, seeing all of these uh, across the indices you've shared with us, are there success stories that you can share with us with regards to uh, how has this impacted financial inclusion, whether with regards to uh, businesses, enterprise, governments, across all of the entire region? Yes. So you, you really don't have to have a bank account. That's the, the mobile money proposition. And what that portends is um, a big opportunity for people to be able to 
um, trade to be able to, you know, transact, get paid, make payments. So that's been very big. Um, when you look at the level of financial inclusion, for example, in Kenya, um, I think in that last number I saw is something in the 80th percentile, which is quite. Chat to us is the communal dimension as opposed to uh, individualism. And now bringing this to perspective, we, we missed a lot of opportunities from our colonial, uh, from the days of, our days of independence to this digital age. I, I consider it missed opportunities in several perspectives, not because there were no gains. Of course, our fathers worked harder and we, are, we too are trying to work harder. So there are gains, but, but again, they function more in silos. So, so for instance, we are, we are talking about financial inclusion. How do we expand the drag nets? And a, a clear factor, in my view, to, uh, digi uh, to financial inclusion is access to finance. For instance, in Nigeria, the, the land tightening system captures less than 40% of the urban lands designated as urban areas in Nigeria, which are typically the, the, the state capitals, right? So the, the urban areas in Nigeria, the lands designated by the government as urban areas, probably less than 40%. Now, the remaining 60% are owned by families and individuals, inheritances, and now is in the capital market is worthless because my father's land in the village, which he suffered to acquire, I can't use it as security. And practically in, in the mainstream land, uh, credit system, right? It's not recognized. It's considered very volatile. And then there's no comprehensive registry, database for verification of title. So. And, and in my view, that creates a disconnect with our drive for financial inclusion. So, so we are leaving a certain, perhaps majority or minority behind. And then, but, but again, we want them to be in, included. So, yeah. so, so this disconnect is something we, I believe the regulators acknowledge and are working on it. And then we need to have a more integrated approach to this. Because CB, so the central banks across Nigeria is a respected institution. They enjoy a lot of trust from the people. Whether they work for it or not, they enjoy it. It's given. Now, and they enjoy more, their integrity bank, data bank is higher than most other regulators. We do respect. And they have to drive certain ideas that we have that will help take us to where we want to be. The, the, consu the consumer seems to be, uh, not that he's in such a level, but he knows what he wants, or at least he, he, he knows what he thinks he wants. And then the, the operators and the regulators, we have to help the consumer understand what he wants much more clearly and then help deliver it to him. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's quite a very critical comment and point to add to it. I would like us to, I'll come back to you Ahiz in a minute. I just want to bring a discussion to this uh, room. Uh, Tunji, listening to you and all of the analysis and opportunities around the continent from that wonderful presentation, it does seem like there is so much that the continent can even do to accelerate its own growth. Um, it's remarkable that if we're looking at Kenya and the East Africa and all of the opportunities, probably because of the common language, proximity, payments, and currencies, they are also able to migrate to unified payment options. But then we also have PAPSA, which is a Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which has been newly introduced. Looking at that, where do you, do you see opportunity for more affordable remittances, more effective remittances, more, in, more uh, beneficial collaboration within the continent, since we're talking cross-border. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I think when it comes to 
opportunities to do more because a lot have been done already. Um, perhaps that you alluded to is a very important, um, the very important payment engine for Africa. So when you think about PAPS, just to make it simpler, some of us understand the way payments work in, in Nigeria, for example. So you can send money from any bank to any bank almost instantaneously. So it really doesn't matter whether you are using you know, a fintech app or you're using a commercial bank app. You can send money because there's a, there's a, there's a common infrastructure through which they all connect to. Um, so that's what PAPS represents, where all central banks get connected to this common infrastructure and money can move from one country to the other. Afrexim Bank provides a liquidity pool. Um, but one thing that is really critical to make that happen is the last mile in, the last mile solution. And that would typically come from the fintech, from the innovators. So, you know, NIPS, which is the um, infrastructure provider for NIP in Nigeria, does not build, just like NIPS doesn't build the actual apps that you use for the banking for payments within the region. Um, perhaps is not also going to be doing that, but hoping that a number of the other innovators across the region can can look into that space. And one, one, one thing we find with innovation is that um, you, 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 you can see innovation coming from anywhere. It doesn't have to be the regulated entities alone. It could even be someone that is still, you know, a student that has an idea to leverage um, perhaps for something around cross-border payments, but leveraging offline as an example. So you need regulation to back that kind of person up. So there's an opportunity for fintechs, whether regulated or um, unregulated fintechs to come on board. But that's where you then begin to see a lot of collaboration opportunities again when it comes to the regulatory landscape. Um, because you are talking about money moving from different jurisdiction with different regulation to others. So that's one. The other bit is around infrastructure, which is always key. Um, some of the segments that are excluded, um, we don't see in the next five years, in the next 10, even 10 years in some segments, when you take a broader Africa perspective, uh, there are certain countries where financial inclusion is still less than 30%. So what tell, that tells you is that most of the countries are excluded. It, could, it may not even be an issue with, with um, electricity. It may be an issue with internet or electricity. So infrastructure that enables us to do digital payments, even within the context of Africa, which is where we are building for Africa. We're thinking about our own problem. USSD is a solution that rides on the telco network. But what more solutions can power offline? Um, I know there are a number of central banks within the continent and outside the continent that are looking at offline solutions, for instance, around CBDCs that you know, enables people to use central bank currency in digital form, but also in a virtual and offline mode. So those are some of the opportunities that I believe we have in announcing um, the, the cross-border payment, building on infrastructure like PAPS to make things seamless, cheaper, and faster. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be coming to you at this time, Ehiz. So we've heard how uh, the continent can leverage all the opportunities and innovation, new product development, expansion of infrastructure so that the reach can actually be higher. When we talk about all of these opportunities, one worrying thing is the consumer. From a risk perspective, being a cybersecurity expert, where is the risk in all of this? And how do you bring protection to the consumer? Because that's very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, thank you again, Tunji, for the presentation. Um, just taking from um, the PAP in, uh, PAPS initiative, um, um, uh, consumers, uh, consumer is key, right? So when you look at financial inclusion, you are looking at the end users. So you, are, you want to see the consumer satisfied. Like I always, I will always say, in most cases in the financial services industry, we sell practically almost the same product. However, what differentiates us is the services, right? And, and looking at it from the cross-border perspective, um, the African region itself, right, is like a small fry. If you look at uh, 
cross-border transfer, right? Um, data, data sharing, um, it's out there to enhance globalization. However, there are, there are key issues around regulations, right? Then from, I think for the, for the past one or two years, I've been following keenly on, on, on issues around data integrity, right? So the Western world is no longer saying uh, the issue of data sharing. Rather, they are saying issue of data integrity. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a case in point. Um, one of, I was reading um, one of uh, this tweet uh, from an influencer few weeks back. Guess what the problem was? Um, is a problem of perception right now, and and the kind the kind from I'm from African region and Nigeria most especially. He was to get just five hundred dollars, but if you see the questions that was being asked from this fellow, he, uh, the, the guy, the guy, the guy, the guy was like, "What is this?" He was even being asked source of income to receive five hundred dollars. So it's no longer. A data sharing issue is now moving from data sharing issue to data integrity. So, uh, from this perspective, I, I think part of the control we should be looking at is that we start looking at how we we, we transact businesses. Right, trust needs to be built across borders, not just in Africa, across the world. People, uh, everybody needs to start saying that when when we transact business that the data we're supplying is actually the data they need to carry out this transaction without doing double check. So that is one of the biggest tricks I see going forward, right? Even with the new announcement that was just made by, I don't know whether it's, it's official, by United uh, um, Kingdom about Japan students, you will see a new trend, a trend where, where we pay school fees for, um, for, for our relations, uh, our, our children and somebody out there, maybe the school is writing to say, can I have a confirmation from the bank that this money is coming from the right source? So I, I see such risk um, um, coming up very soon. But the onus is on us are from Africa, especially Nigeria, to start changing the way we do business. And when we share data, let the data integrity be something that we can say yes. This is the right information we're giving out. The PAPS initiative will do a bit, but because we rely more, we have more people in the Western world where um, uh, we have the big fish in terms of the kind of cross-border transfer we do, we will need to do more to provide assurance to the Western world that we're ready to do business. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's extremely important that you brought those discussions around data to the table. Because uh, the more we are expanding and the reach is higher, the more we are sharing data, the more that uh, consumers are at risk. Osita, do you have anything to add with regards to data as we expand financial inclusion? What sort of risk do you see? From a consumer perspective, I mean, we've heard from the risk part, but from a consumer perspective, every single day, I don't know about others in the room, you just take a peep into Twitter and 50% of the messages are people who are facing issues with their financial accounts. So people are losing money by even being included, deciding on their own to deal with banks. You make payments that never get to the person. You get debited for transactions that you have actually uh, settled. And sometimes there are triple debits to your, to your account and there is no reconciliation from it. So from a consumer perspective, do you want to share anything with uh, regards to the risks? Yeah, yes, I will. I will, but then permit me to approach it from a regulator and operator's standpoint. Anyone works. Yes. Thank you. I, I, say, I say this because the, the glitches that lead to failed transactions, either fa completely failed transactions or successful but failed. So successful but fa failed is where the beneficiary, where, the, where I am debited, but then the beneficiary does not receive value. So successful from my end, but then failed transaction. So, and then it's a problem for the operator and it's a problem for, for the consumer. Sometimes too, it takes the operators a longer time to get, a, to get their money back, to get value back. Now, 
But then the, the, the consumer is impatient. And then the consumer too is short on funds, or at least shorter on funds. Because everybody could be short on funds. But then the consumer is shorter on funds. Now, in terms of data, again, it brings me back to what I, met, I, I stated earlier on about an integrated approach to all this. Now, the, 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 the FLESA has been asked about source of funds. Again, rightly or wrongly may feel, may take offense. But, but again, we, we remember that in, in money laundering, so money laundering is one of the risks that remittance and cross-border payment faces, right? But, but typically in Nigeria, the suspected uh, Yahoo boy, so the Yahoo boy is the person who is uh, suspected, right, to be a digital froster. And then the, the person who has returned from Malaysia, so the, they call them Malaysia returnees in Nigeria, are those probably who spent a longer time in prison in Malaysia for drug-related offenses. What happens? They come back to Nigeria and they get police protection and they pay for it. So these are suspects. I use the term suspect, but socially they are convicted in the eyes of the society. Society has convicted them. That is, so the society claims that they understand that this is their source of funds. But then they come back and they get police protection in Nigeria. Now the question is, could the FCC have looked into this without a petition? Or could FIRS, so the, the, the tax uh, authorities, have looked into their source of funds which we are, they are getting police protection for before they got police protection? Could the state's tax entities have done this? Now, if we take an integrated approach to all this, we, I think, in my view, we will easily combat money laundering and CFT. And then again, restore integrity and trust back to the regulators and the operators. Because these monies leave the financial institution. I don't think they come in in their handbag. And if they do, there are customs people at the port of entry and port of departure. So, so but, but what I am suggesting is that to bring to, to, to again regain the trust that we enable the, the consumer voluntarily give data, we need to show him or her that we are taking a more integrated approach to protecting his livelihood and his life. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you very much. And I'll add to that data protection. So whether because of their lives or even because of what is their, you know, their property, you, we must also have to assure that that protection happens. Thank you very much. I'm going to be coming to you, Tunji, but this is going to be the last. And then we'll just take final words from everybody as we come this way. And that's going to be on partnerships and collaborations. So we've highlighted the opportunities with cross-border remittances, trade, whether it's at the level of B, uh, B to C, C to C, and even the government. But where do you see opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for partnership across this big, broad continent? As we find opportunity with PAPS, what do we think can happen with policy, regulation, product innovation, and consumer protection? Where can we leverage partnerships? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's a really good point uh, in terms of some of the key next steps that I think we need to be focused on. Partnership is a big one. And if you dimension the space and you look at the stakeholders and the different domains of interest, you start touching on areas like policy. Uh, if you take policy, for example, you have multiple regulators in a, in a jurisdiction like Nigeria, for example, that could possibly have oversight on how payment across the region is done. CBN is there. You have NIPDA that will have an overview and oversight around data, privacy, and, and things like that. Um, so there are, many, there are many other dimensions that you can think about when it comes to policy as well, the government, legislation, and all of that. So having a clear focus around the objective, policies that drive payments that drive inclusion is going to be key. And that's you know, part of pro providing enabling infrastructure, 
um, you know, central banks, for instance, across the region coming together and perhaps the story of collaboration. And we need to see more of that. How can central banks across the region also foster harmonization of policies? Otherwise, you're going to have arbitrage when it comes to um, the way regulation works. If a fintech or an innovator finds that the regulation around payment and transfer of funds from one country to another is probably more lax in one country, they probably facilitate their payment through that, which ultimately does not address some of the risk we were talking about around AML, CFT. When you think about the players as well, there are multiple players that need to come together because the infrastructure that is needed to drive truly inclusive payment is not only within the, the banking industry. You think about telco, for example. So fostering that innovation, whether it's telco-led or bank-led, innovation collaboration is what is key. FinTech bank partnership is another key one to talk about. Ultimately, the customers are the ones impacted. So how do we you know, have a partnership mindset with the consumer? in a way that they are educated on some of the risk, right? There are a number of Ponzi schemes pretending to be solutions to facilitate payment, but consumer education is required. So having agencies, having um, bodies that are dedicated to addressing those kind of risks in terms of educating consumers, what works, what doesn't work, the prevailing regulation, and just working with the broader ecosystem to drive this solution, I think, will be key. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. What do you see, and I'm coming to you, Sita, as we go there, partnership, final word on partnership. Yes. So, so partnership, is the, for me, is the only way. Partnership collaboration. Because as we are talking about the Pan-African uh, uh, payments and uh, settlement system, again, we need to be looking beyond the curve. What I mean by looking beyond the curve is that there are opportunities, there will be risks, right? And then what that means is that it's an opportunity for everyone, for regulators, for operators, not only to, to not develop a similar application, but how do we help to enhance the infrastructure that they have built? So continue building on what they have built on because there's that's where partnership comes in. Because again, from a remittance point of view, someone in uh, Malawi, for instance, who earns in dollars, and a Ghanaian, and he wants to return money to, remit money to Ghana, probably may want this, if, for a typical Nigerian, he will remit it in dollars. Why? Because I, I withdraw dollars, go to black market, and my people get more value. So, so there are already four structures, existing structures that we have to dismantle to reduce costs, transaction costs, which again helps the consumer because the consumer pays for all this. Yeah. So, so we, we need to take a more integrated approach and then collaborate more and think further to solve today's problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Would we'll let you wrap up on the entire plenary. Uh, is so that we can take questions and answers um, with the audience. Uh, I, I do believe that there may be people in the audience, whether they are online or in the room, who've got questions that they would like to address. Yeah. So I have received one already, and that question is with regards to digital remittances and the proliferation of those across the entire Africa. And that was addressed to you, uh, Tunji. And the, the, that is with regards to what sort of mitigants with regards to all of those structures that are supposed to be Ponzi and consumers may be losing resources on them because they cannot decipher between what's credible and, not, and what's not credible. Yeah, I, I think a big part of it is what I touched on earlier is education, um, educating the consumers about the prevailing regulation at times, this regulation goes to the sector as a communique, and the, the end users may not even be privy to what is the regulator's stand about certain products, about certain service types. Uh, we know, for instance, in Nigeria, the central bank uh, 
sort of distance itself to crypto solutions. Um, I was seeing other countries where there's a lot more openness to it. Uh, so it's, it varies from country to country. So, but being able to educate the, the consumers will be key. The other thing is around regulation, right? The regulation has to be such that it does as much as possible to take out those illicit actors. I know sometimes earlier, I think last year, um, there was there was the communication from Google in East Africa that if you need, if you wanted to to deploy an app on the Play Store, so if you were if you are providing a digital any solution, you would need a clearance from the central bank. So that's something that again you can see the the a big tech provider like Google with a platform where these potential Ponzi schemes or illicit um, solution provider can deploy their solution saying you need clearance. So those are also possible ways that, and that speaks to public, um, public private partnership, where the pr private sector player like Google is looking at a platform like the Play Store and saying, I can't open this up for anybody to just come in. So you've got to be regulated or at least get some form of licensing. So those are some of the things I see. Awesome. Um, that we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Is yes, we, we have. Or... A, I think one, uh, Madam raised her hands and then right. I have Israel here. All right. um, I need him to ask his question over to you. Oh, okay. uh, so we'll do F4. Israel and we'll get on the floor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Israel. Um, I have a question that is brought in my mind. Uh, like uh, three years before now, let's say three to five years before now, from your personal, maybe MasterCard account, Link with your maybe uh, what's the name of this? PayPal. Is it PayPal? Uh, PayPal, and you want to buy anything online? You don't need to. Uh, I don't need to bother my head paying for any of my whatever online. And immediately I make payment, it convert itself. We pick the equivalent, and that's all. But presently, I notice the just single Google account maybe. You have something you need to pay for on your government. Okay, recently I want to upgrade my cloud account just to pay. It's like, okay, I need to start looking for a third party, fourth party, pay, <laughs> do. So, what is really, I want to know what is really happening. What? All right. Okay. Regulation All right. issues. I would like to, yes, I'll pass that on to you, Ahibs. Do you want okay. to throw light uh, very briefly? Okay, quickly. Uh, um, in terms of what has changed, because yeah, yeah. we do know that. Quickly, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's part of government policy. You know, yeah. uh, we got ourselves in a space where we need to conserve um, the little dollar we have. And uh, our dollar earning drops, we are not expecting as we should. And therefore, we had to make do with the little we have. And mind you, we also have um, um, on loans that we needed to, that we, we were paying or will still be paying on um, dollar dominated loans. And because of that, um, um, uh, the government felt it's it's okay to close out all those spaces for, through the banks that my dollars used to like fly out of the country, like through the PayPal accounts that I used to um, um, uh, make use of. You remember at a point you can use up to two hundred dollars from your um, um, uh, ATM card. That was reduced to hundred dollar to fifty dollar to no dollar. So that is what really happened. So awesome. it's just government policies. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. I think it's as brief as it should be. We have seen all of those changes, and there are there are more important things that are chasing the dollars than the little individual payments, including school fees as well, because there are people who are also trying to keep their children abroad. So regulatory Israel, sorry about that. Thank you. We've got one question from the floor. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. My name is Aisha. I work for the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, maybe I should also ask that uh, aside that we have two parallel rates, which is also the reason why you will discourage such usage of dollar because I can use my Naira card, return the dollar back to the country, and I'm sure we're all aware at some point some people were caught with over 4,000 cards. So what they do is to go across the border, uh, infuse 
what you think is a merchant or purchase transaction, but that's not the case. They just get those dollars together, bring it in, sell at the black market, pay the money into the bank, then go back again and spend using the bank rate. So in most countries anyway, there are deliberate government policy to discourage that. Again, you need to conserve the dollar. Uh, if you go to Malaysia today, if you want to buy made in Malaysia, you will pay very cheap. But if you want to buy any imported goods, you will be heavily taxed. So the essence is also to encourage buy Nigeria, made in Nigeria. But my main question is contribution to someone who said we do not have the National Collateral Registry to support maybe borrowings for, for people asking for low uh, amounts. But I think uh, the National Collateral Registry is operational, is functional, but it has to do with our slow starter as a nation. I'll give an example. You recall when we started the ATM machine, people will still go and queue in the banking hall rather than go to the machine. But today, it's optimally used. So I believe as from this uh, conference and as we also do more consumer literacy, people will know that you can use your movable asset to serve as collateral. But when we drill down to this conference, why should we be asking someone who wants to take 10,000 Naira for collateral or 2,000 or 5,000 to go and buy plantain. I mean, we're talking about financial inclusion and economic uh, inclusiveness. So I think as a nation, we should begin to build that national database, which is our national identity number, so that we all can be held responsible for our action. That way, if I walk into a bank, they can profile me, they know what I do, they can see my history, and I can take maybe as little as 20,000 or even up to 100,000, depending on my turnover, without collateral, which is what is happening in other, other jurisdictions, especially that will benchmark. I think uh, for the cross-border uh, PAPS, PAPS is under my desk, so uh, PAPS is also picking up, but the worry now is we do not have a uniform currency. So as long as we benchmark against dollar, some of the participating countries will have more reserve than others. And as long as there are loopholes for arbitrage, I mean, we're all human, people will take advantage of that. So I can still go to Ghana, infuse a merchant, what I think is a POS transaction, but that's not the case. I just pay some discount, get money, and return to the country. And Nigeria will be funding that in dollars. So we're actually going to be leaving loophole for us to still take out from the little reserve that we have. But I believe if we go and still go, I mean, work on the echo currency, which is something that we have been trying to do over 20 years, that will give us, we don't have to rely on a third currency to do settlement and that way there won't be arbitrage and genuinely if we need to do transaction and settle across border that will happen seamlessly thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much for bringing that deliberations to the room and um, our time is far gone and i know also that people have are spending more minutes than they had budgeted for <laughs> as we wrap up i'll just begin to talk about a few of the things that we touched on today and every single one of us on the plenary are also more than available, even after this, to have one-on-one -on -one with us. And so within this plenary, we've highlighted a lot of the opportunities with regards to financial inclusion as we drive remittances and cross-border uh, transactions across the, uh, the continent. Our focus for this plenary is the continent, where the continent is huge and big on its own and totally untapped. And so when we're looking at cross-border, we're looking at the opportunities within the continent. We also noted how there is great opportunity for East Africa, especially with regards to proximity, currency, language, much more than other areas of uh, Africa. The opportunities are limitless, no doubt, but we would continue to pursue them. Perhaps uh, to, the, to the table, no doubt, we bring quite a lot of opportunities. And like we highlighted, 
thanks to CBN for also throwing up the in, uh, inhibitions around PAPS. But the good thing is we would continue to improve and get better. And probably in one day, even if it's not in our generation, there will be a single currency for the continent and uh, an acceptable currency for the continent. You can clap to that if you want to. It's desirable, isn't it? Yeah, of course, I, it, it will make a lot of the issues easier. And um, we also brought a lot of discussions around uh, protecting the consumer, because as we migrate and expand the reach with cross-border trades, transactions, and payments, it means that a greater number of people are exposed. So those exposures are very critical to highlight. And we've talked around data protection, which is really very critical. We've also talked about the, the fact that in driving those mitigants, infrastructures are important. We've talked also about um, partnerships and collaborations, driving innovation, new products, new designs, new um, infrastructures that can also help to deliver more efficiently. But very remarkable also is policy because we can also partner around policies and bring down the volume of resources around regulation so that collaboratively regulatory bodies and agencies can work much more together and smarter to be able to add uh, significant value against across the continent, both for the consumers and of course citizens, and more importantly, the entire economy of the continent. So on this note, I have summarized all of our deliberations on the last one hour, and I'm bringing this plenary to a close. And I would like to say thank you to everybody who were part of this. Tunji, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Asita, for sharing thoughts. And thank you, thank you, Ace, for sharing thoughts with us. And I would also say a big thank you to RegTech Africa for putting this together, bringing Africa to the world. This is a very remarkable global conference that has, you know, beamed Africa to the rest of the world. And for everybody who's attending and listens to us from everywhere online, thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic, fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please can you put your hands together one more time uh, for Madam Malise. I mean, beautifully done, excellently, you know, anchored. I'm so excited. I learned so much in my mind. I was wishing we shouldn't end till like seven o'clock, but obviously, you and I know we want to retire. Uh, we're going to have a picture moment. Of course, Sirius should be up here uh, to come in. And uh, Mr. Ojo, as well, we joined, as the case is. So let's have you guys here for the picture. Uh, photographer, whoa. Where is Shola? Okay. Yeah, please come on closer. Uh, Graham, you're okay. The man is saying, all right. Thank you very much. I quickly want to say thank you one more time again. Um, I've said so many thanks to you. Sure, okay, please, can you come up? I'm very sure you're going to help me do the final wrap-up and the vote of thanks. Uh, then we will we'll officially close um, the conference. Tomorrow is open for networking and social engagement, uh, just for your awareness. So please, ladies and gentlemen, have that behind your mind as the case is. Thank you, sir. It's on? Great. So we're on to our final day. Um, let me just first say thanks to the MC. He's done a great job. Um, particularly at the start today when uh, we're having all those many technical glitches. Maybe I preempted it by saying that yesterday, um, this was the one concern I had, and it seemed to, be, to have materialized today. So be careful what you say. Um, on behalf of the Advisory Council for the 2023 Rectic Africa Conference, I want to say a big thank you um, to all the delegates, all the participants, uh, both those who, who stayed behind um, in person and those online as well. Um, I think one major lesson, lesson to learn here for us um, uh, advising Serial uh, for next year's conference is to, you know, how we manage when you have lunch. Because clearly, um, our very carbohydrate-laden kind of lunch is not conducive for uh, the kind of discussion we had afterwards. But... Um, the discussions have been very insightful. We've been really pleased with the repertoire of um, speakers and panel members that were put together. 
Um, today in particular, despite being the uh, last but not the least day, so really exciting conversations, um, particularly around cybersecurity, my specialty, was quite pleased with the uh, kind of engagement that we saw. And then even also this last conversation, you know, that was just had to as well. Um, it was clear that it was uh, very, very engaging. Um, so on that note again, we thank you all so much. There's a lot that we've learned as the advisory council, although I'm the one person who's on ground, the others online too as well, um, uh, in their respective home countries. We've all taken notes from um, various things that have gone well, perhaps not gone not so well. Um, and we expect that we'll infuse all that into the conference that we have next year and future events we'll have before the annual conference. Again, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening.